Welcome at the former dark room of the Volkskrant, the newspaper. Um, I'm excited that I don't know more than the half of you. I d it's the first time I meet you. And that's, of course, one of the good things of tonight. Um, let me first uh, invite Thomas Sedlacek here. And uh, of course, uh, I met your work, I met your uh, philosophy, I met you, uh, you in person, and I felt like, okay, somebody from a total different field of my own, because I'm a composer, I create music, uh, you're an economist, um, what do you create? <laughs> Theories. Fantasies. <laughs> Stories. <laughs> Stories. Good. Because since the moment I started researching this area of interconnecting economics with everything else, um, economics has become such a detached sort of a, um, uh, in our specialized society, it, is, it, was, it was intentionally detached because during the Enlightenment period, we discovered that the knowledge that we have as mankind is bigger than can fit one single brain, which wasn't the case all the way till then. We had Renaissance men and women who actually could read every single book that was written in that year because there was not so many. But there came a time where we actually came to the realization that the intelligence of the reality or whatever is much, uh, much, much, much larger than can fit into even the most genius um, brain or soul of, of, of one human being. So we decided to do two steps. One step in which I think we were quite successful was you do that, you do this, you do nails, you do ears, you do bones, you do economy, you do dancing, you do talking, you do painting, etc., etc., etc. We all go research into these different areas. We specialize in our knowledge. That one step was, I think, quite successful and it got us uh, where we are right now with all the good and with also some of the bad. Uh, but the second step of, of enlightenment, I think, would never did take place, or perhaps it is taking place right now, but the second part of that deal was, first we run around, everybody goes, discovers his or her things about whatever she or he likes, and then the second step is, we come together and we put the picture together, because it is a cliche to say that everything is connected with everything. Uh, cliche means that it's so true that it is redundant to um, be repeated. Also, I was just thinking today that cliches are perhaps the only truths that we have in our society. So don't be so, as I always at the cliche, to look down on cliches. Um, uh, perhaps we should appreciate cliches because that's the only common uh, democratically agreed upon truth that we have. Cliche is that everything is connected. We all know that psychology is connected with economics and that economics is connected with sociology and sociology is connected with politics and arts and everything. But we haven't really put it um, together. So this is why I think maybe if, if the division of knowledge has gotten us this far, well, perhaps there is a huge energy in our mutual endeavor in actually trying to put it together. We have universities. This is a legacy of the Enlightenment area. University means universal, everything. Everything means everything. And uh, we sort of forgot that. Our universities no longer serve as a space where sociologists could debate economists and artists and, 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 and doctors and uh, so, um, technicians or, or people who actually write computer programs. So I was very happy for this hand that I got from uh, from. Merlin. It's interesting, actually, if you go all the way back through our literature, the literature that our culture has produced, you will very quickly discover that since the moment we learned how to write, we were actually talking about this topic that I think we'll um, uh, have as a, as, as a topic of tonight, and that is the connecting of the, the exact, the hard, the building, the, the, the constructive, the structural, with something else. Let's call it art for, uh, for, for now. As, as difficult as it is to define art 
let's just call it the other dimension, something else, something that we can't really point our, our, our finger at. So if you read the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the uh, oldest text, well, the oldest narrative, the oldest story, the oldest fairy tale, the oldest fantasy that we, uh, as mankind, have, regardless of, 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 of uh, other writings, mm -hmm. this fundamentally is the oldest writing, there the topic is exactly this. For those of you who've read it, you know that the basic narrative in the Epic of Gilgamesh is that there is a one third, no, two thirds God, one third human being, a mighty ruler, today we would say tyrant, but those days it was a ruler of um, Uruk. And he was building a wall around the city and that wall of course symbolically uh, separates culture, civilization from nature and uh, also from enemies. But the symbolic reason, this is also why the Babylonians have their ziggurats the, the anthropologists believe that they were so moving the hills, the holy hills, into the city. They were sort of domesticating hills. Like today, we have domesticated water. What you, what you have from your taps isn't really water. It's a dead derivative of water, or better yet, it's domesticated water. Because we are afraid of the water, as it, especially here in the Netherlands, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> the fear of water is fully justified. Um, so like you build dams, uh, they build walls to shield it from nature, from the unpredictable, from the tides and from the waves and from things that we cannot influence. And Gilgamesh was um, um, uh, building this wall with the use of his slaves or subjects or the people that lived there. And he wanted to increase their efficiency of building the wall by banning them to meet with their children and with their uh, wives, because it was, it was men who were building this wall. So the idea of Gilgamesh was that he wants to increase efficiency of his people by banning them to be people and turning them into what you would today call robots. Now, robots is an interesting word because Czechs have not, well, we have contributed beer, and uh, Kafka and Kundera and Havel. And the word robot is actually a Czech word. Uh, to robot means to work. Robotnik is a worker. So robot is a worker. You could even call it perhaps a slave because that's what your uh, technology does for you. Your computer, your printer, your car is a sort of a machine that slaves for you. It has to listen to you. Your car cannot run away whenever it pleases, uh, it is in your 100% control. Anyway, that's the, that's the idea. So Gilgamesh was trying to create robots out of people, what now, for 6,000 years uh, before. It is, again, the oldest narrative that we have. And um, the belief was a little bit similar like today, in, uh, or like, let's say, 50 years ago in HR human resources, we have natural resources, and then we have human resources uh, to be used in uh, the machinery of economy. That's why it's a resource. Uh, very often it's a source, it's not a resource because you, it's not sort of renewable, but that's just uh, me being particular about certain words. Um, so uh, we also discovered that, yeah, you know, this, if, it, if only, this is a dream of any tyrant to actually have subjects who listen to whatever the tyrant once, and uh, best of all situations, they listen to you word for word, believing that it's actually their own will. This is called advertisement, but that's a, that's a, that's a different, uh, different topic. So he was, he was stripping mankind of this mankindness. It's English also in this is a beautiful word. He was trying to exactly get away, get, get rid of all the artistic, rid of all the human, rid of all the emotions, um, uh, because he believed, and I, I suspect that this belief is still quite strong within us, that, human, be that uh, human relations are here to slow us down. So Gilgamesh is creating these robots out of human beings. We today create robots out of machines, out of iron, whatever, but he was trying to create robots out of human beings in order to increase their work efficiency. 
Now, uh, the people are revolting against this, and today when we are not happy with something, we complain to politicians, and we take the streets, and we, we say something, and then they say something else, and that's how we negotiate. Those days, they would complain to guards. Empirically speaking, it seems to be a much more efficient method because gods, um, or Ashtar in, uh, in, in particular, in, as a subset of her PR, she actually uh, answers the prayers of the Vox Populi in this case, and she sends a brood animal to stop Gilgamesh. His name is Enkidu. Enkidu is a wild beast. He lives in the, he lives in the nature. He spoils the traps of um, the, the, the huntsmen and he kills the herds of the shepherds, etc., etc. Well, he simply creates havoc, and he is something between a human being and an animal, and he constantly attacks the city that Gilgamesh is so hard trying to protect. So, of course, my favorite writing is uh, under the line. So, uh, a, a, a footnote under the line, a hero always creates a villain. So if you ever want in your beautiful Amsterdam to have a Superman or, or Avenger, be sure that the moment he, or Catwoman to be politically correct, uh, or she actually starts existing in your city, immediately an anti-pole of a negative hero will be created and they will never win. They will always fight with each other without one winning over the other. This is exactly what happened in the oldest science fiction uh, in the epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was fighting Enkidu over and over again. None of them could win. This is, of course, uh, a psychological image of the part in us that wants to be constructive and the part in us that actually wants to be soft.